thank you everybody for coming after dinner and uh, um, staring at the haunting eyes for a couple extra minutes. Let me, uh, let me start by doing a little bit here. I'll, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike Wokash. I'm an attorney. For the purposes of this presentation, I am not your attorney. Uh, I am a board game designer, uh, a TGC contest winner. Um, I'm a husband, father of two. My eldest is also a published board game designer. Uh, he is with us in the back right there. Uh, I like board games, video games, D&D, volleyball, travel, beer, cheese, uh, not necessarily that order. Uh, I typed into Midjourney uh, in preparation for this a fantasy illustration of a 45-year-old male, white attorney, dark hair, glasses, board game designer, nerdy. That is a pretty darn good representation of me. <laughs> I will take it. Nailed it. As we'll, as we'll quickly learn, AI is never wrong and everything it does is perfectly uh, as you ask for it. Um, so I had a couple things that I wanted to uh, cover in this topic. First of all, just to, I know that there's been a couple sessions earlier about generative AI, chat GPT, a couple things like that. I wanted to quickly touch on that again. Uh, I wanted to go over how I see generative AI being used in board game design um, I want to also cover the thing that most of you are probably the most interested about, uh, how generative AI crashes headlong into copyright laws, other intellectual property laws, um, sort of the moral and ethical dilemmas that generative AI um, introduces for a lot of people. <laughs> I am fully aware that by giving this presentation and Tavis being so nice as to post it on Reddit and have this on TikTok, uh, that there is a lot of emotional response to the use of generative AI in art, in board games, in media, um, you know, that to the point that any use of any form of generative AI in any creative endeavor is met with a lot of stigma, a lot of resentment. Um, I'm taking this from a very, very non-emotional perspective that generative AI is just a tool and it's not a substitute for skilled talent, authors, writers, creative folks, and you'll, I think you'll see that come out in this, but I also want to touch on why I think at the end of the day, from a legal perspective, unless there are big significant legal changes, most of generative AI is not going to run afoul of most intellectual property law uh, uh, rights that we have in the United States as it is today. We'll get to that part. <clears throat> So what is generative AI? And this is Midjourney giving me Kanye uh, holding a pink stuffy, which was actually a pretty good image when I did it the first time. Uh, but generative AI does more, a lot more things than just make fun of celebrities. Um, and for a board game designer, I just wanted to go through like what these tools look like, how you can use them, what sorts of things that you can get out of them. I largely took the perspective that when I talk about generative AI, it is a huge world of tools that are out there. It's basically text, image, video, audio, 3D modeling tools that generate new content based on a given training set of data or input data. Um, most of the time when you interact with these tools, you are giving it a prompt, you are asking it for something, and it gives you far more content than you put into it. Um, what I won't do, and I'm gonna just tell you right now, is I'm not gonna go into the world of all these tools. There's just too many, they change daily, there's so many of them. My familiarity with individual AI tools is just the top layer, most common ones that are out there. Most of this presentation relied a lot on Midjourney and on ChatGPT, um, two things that I regularly use, but there are a whole, there's just a whole huge realm of them and um, it doesn't take much to find a kind of AI generative tool uh, to fit your need. So just really quickly, and this is about as cursory as I can get. So how does it work? Basically, a generative AI system starts with a huge ton of information, data that's relevant to what it is trying to produce. It takes a bunch of this data, it creates a bunch of math, what are called neural networks, does a bunch of math, converts it down into something, that is then able to take new inputs, look at the training data and say, oh, these inputs map to these other kinds of inputs that I've seen before. It generates a result. 
And then over time, they're refined either by humans or by more, uh, more labor. That is all I'm gonna do. Um, I will also say that it is a general matter, the difference between a lot of techniques that have happened in the past and what are happening today, most of the generative AI, they do not retain the data, they do not copy data up out of a database and manipulate it or apply a filter. It is legitimately new, different ones and zeros in the background that you get. They don't need the training data in order to continue to use and generate the output. They use it to refine it, but that's a different story, and we'll get to that in a second. That's all I'm gonna really talk about, because otherwise you could go on for three hours about that alone. I told JT that uh, we could do this presentation and I could take three days if you wanted me to. Um, so I wanna do the really quick thing, because there's not a lot of time in an hour, but I wanna talk about how I've seen generative AI used as tools in board game designs in ways that are maybe a little different than what Nicole had talked about earlier in terms of just breaking the writer's block, um, things that I think are probably more practical and don't run headlong into a lot of the intellectual property concerns we'll talk about in a second. But before we do that, let's talk about what it's not good at because there is a whole huge realm and I think a lot of people when they look at this topic in this area or the first time they pick up one of the AI tools, like, all they see is the bad. They see extra digits, they see extra fingers, they see you know, wonky eyeballs, they, think, they see things like telephones with cords going out to both sides of them. Um, as a general matter, most of these tools fall down on some of the things that most humans are pretty good at perceiving, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of results are at best B or C work, not A or B. Um, you know, they, for image generation, and we'll talk about some specific examples, they're really bad at consistency. If you want the same person, same thing, repeatedly in different perspectives, in different settings, it is actually really, really hard to make that work really, really well. It's much easier to go to a human and say, I'd like the same stick figure just to the right of here and in this pose rather than that pose. It's hard to make an image generation do that. It's hard to be very specific. It's very hard to ask it to be reasonable and give me a reasonable outcome. They, they do a lot of fanciful things like two telephone cords on an old timey telephone, wrong numbers of holes, that sort of things. For text generation, a lot of the complaints that you see have to do with the AI being really bad at math or being really bad at facts, really bad at it understanding its own limitations. Like it doesn't know when to stop where a human might very well do those things. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot and the other thing I'll point out is if you use any of these tools, those AI tools reflect the data that was in their training set. So whatever biases, whatever sample set that they had, um, you know, if you ask for an average person, it's very likely to be a white male or white female character rather than somebody more diverse, which is really just reflects the, you know, sort of the data that's in the system. Um, you know, so I gave the example of the telephone with the wrong number of cords, you know, which African countries start with the letter K, ChatGPT gave me Kenya and Comoros. Obviously only one of those has a K. It didn't know the difference. I, I said, well, actually only one of those has a K. It's, it said, yeah, and then it gave me two other wrong answers. So just you know, getting that, that out of the way, like it's not good at lots of things and the, you can't really substitute a human. Maybe things will get better. I don't know. Um, two other things from a board game designer's perspective. I will just tell you from experience, it is, all of these systems are very bad at being inventive. If you say, I want a holiday card game with a unique mechanic in it, it has no idea what to do. It doesn't even know where to start. It's very bad. It will give you the same things that's seen before, the same patterns that's seen before. It's really hard at keep retaining context. So like, I need 100 cards, 100 cards that are all slightly different in this way, and I need them to, the more sort of context you give it, it's really hard at retaining it and then it doesn't know how to factor on it. And we can talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if you ask it to do complicated novel connections about things, like if you're creating a drafting game and you're trying to figure out the math or the stats or what combos or pairs or power, you know, it's not good at those things. And it's really bad at understanding individual moving parts. Even if I told it there are 18 cards in this game, they're numbered like this, 
what, you know, like, what are the kinds of plays, what are the probabilities, it's just, it doesn't get those things. How could you, you know, how could you improve that? It doesn't do that very well. Um, those are, this is not a good tool for the, that yet, at least not the public ones. <clears throat> so, that said, I'm here because I think a lot of people view there to be a lot of good possibilities and a lot of options. And so some of the things that um, I found it particularly good for, I'm just gonna go through them really pretty quickly so we can get to the law stuff. One of them is, it's really good at creating summaries. If you've got a written rule set that you can copy into ChatGPT and you can ask it, hey, I would like you to create a sell sheet for a board game based on these rules, can you tell me what the four cool factors are? It's actually really good at that. It might not be A work, it might still need manipulation, but it's pretty good at distilling that information down, especially a lot of it. Um, you can ask it what are the game hooks, what are the special mechanics, what are those sorts of things. You can actually get it to do that. Um, I fed it a whole D&D adventure that I was writing and I asked, can you just write me a one paragraph summary that I could stick at the top of a adventure summary, adventure summary, and yeah, it did it pretty well. I told it to write it like it was uh, a D&D adventure book and that they are an editor and it was great. Um, it still took some editing, but it was pretty close to what I would want out of a one paragraph summary. This one for anybody who's a component studio user uh, is really great. So if you need a fresh set of lists to create and you're like, man, I am struggling to come up with 18 Greek gods or fantasy gods and I wanna stick it into, chat, uh, into Component Studio to create a template set of print and play cards. Like literally that's what I did. I just asked it to create a list of 18 modern common people through our present followers or this might not be the right one. Um, I also asked it to create the gods for the same game and it did that. It gave me most of what I was asking for and then I could just copy and paste it into a spreadsheet and load it into Component Studio and I've got something to work with. It's actually really good at that and um, I, there was an earlier presentation where they were, they were showing like, you know, like typing a bunch of stuff of random startup things into a spreadsheet. You can just get ChatGPT to give you the starting place and then you can manipulate it from there and instead of typing out 18 lines for this, 30 seconds later cut and paste and you've got something to start with. Yeah, I think that these two don't match but the idea is the same. Um, you know, one of the other things it's pretty good at is what I'll call directed creativity. So this is, you have an idea, you are asking it to refine itself over and over and over again. So uh, in this particular one, I was asking it for made up words that a D&D race might use to describe the darkness. I'm like, okay, just give me that. Well, it wasn't good the first time. I'm like, okay, give me words that you just made up that sound like it. And then it iterate on that. And then I asked it one more time, um, yeah, well maybe you can just change the spellings and add a couple misspellings so it sounds more slang-like and it would just slowly adjust it and it would give me a, at least a starting point. I didn't end up using this for much of anything but it was at least a thing it could do. Um, and it's a good starting point and I'm not rewriting all of the options every time. It is just doing it for me and I'm writing one sentence, um, essentially rephrases of it. Uh, and this works for a lot of things. The, the example, of, I think, on the previous slide of uh, gods, I think the one on the left, um, I kept saying, okay, give me ancient gods, give me a mix of gods, give me uh, Greek gods, and I just did it until I got a, a set of lists that, I, that looked like I wanted it to look like. <laughs> the other thing, I, I think this one's not that unusual, but a lot of people use it to create references. So, give me a trading card game back uh, in the style of Skyrim or something like that. And uh, my general experience is it's very hard to use these right out of mid-journey, but you could definitely use it as a starting point for design elements or what you might look, um, look for. Ditto for the set of, you know, give me a set of icons for food in the style of Picasso. None of those icons make much sense, but it's actually an interesting sort of idea of what it would look like. Um, you know, the other thing that you can do is if you're having a hard time, this is the writer's block idea. Coming up with words just to fill in your flavor text, to fill in that extra information, 
just start with, it's a, it's a C at best probably, maybe a B, but it's at least something more than nothing at the, at the starting point. Um, and I'll just say the last one is, it's also really good at enumerating options. So give me a bunch of words that might represent X, Y, or Z, and it will just give you a bunch of words that represent those, and then you look through the list and find one that might work for you for that purpose. For those of you who were just downstairs and played this game with me, I literally made this game in about an hour. I did ask uh, Midjourney for a blank card game template office holiday party theme in the style of a trading card game, full frame, two thirds, and then I, I went through and I just created a, used the same prompt to create all of the art for the game, and in about an hour I had a fully functioning game, which actually I think probably worked, it sounded like. So, um, it is possible to rapidly prototype to get to a pretty ridiculously good looking game in about an hour um, if you were to use some of the um, image generation tools. It didn't take much extra work on my behalf. A couple other things for those that are out there. I don't know if you're aware of this. There are some really great upscaling. So if you have a low res image, um, like the one on the left here, uh, this is, this was actually a high-res image that I 6 x and you can see it's blurry, it's not great. I used the AI upscaler, free one, uh, and you almost couldn't tell the difference that I had scaled it up six times to get that image. Um, it stayed pretty good, and I think you can actually kind of tell in this presentation that it worked out all right. Um, AI upscalers are, are phenomenal if you have really low-res images. Um, I'll point this one out too, because this actually happened in one of our one of the games that I had published. Um, all the art was the wrong dimensions. They were all off by a little bit. The, there was no such thing as in-painting and out-painting at the time, but being able to take a, an image that you had an artist create, if you need to change its dimensions or its cropping, if you need to go from landscape to portrait because you changed the orientation of your card or the way your frame works. Uh, most of the tools nowadays, the, the image tools, you can literally out-paint so you can take this original image and then add extra details that the AI basically filled in um, and it keeps it more or less consistent, makes it a little bit bigger, you can crop it to a different size perspective, combine that with the AI upscaler and you've got all kinds of options. This, by the way, I think for anybody who's bought art at the wrong dimensions and changed their frame or design, like that alone might be worth uh, the price of admission. Uh, especially if you need to make the changes quickly and you can't wait um, three months for the artist to get back to you with 100 new cards uh, at different dimensions. It's a very painful way to go. Um, I miss part of Nicole's. I don't know how much she talked about this, but frequently when I'm designing games, I don't have a fleshed out rule set. I have a bunch of notes. I have you know, sketched out ideas. Uh, they're not written like a human being would ever write rules. Uh, you can literally take that in, say here's, the, here's all the rules that I've written down, can you put them into a format that looks like a, a regular rule set, you can tell it to act like a professional editor for, <laughs> for board and card game rules, you can give it the formula you want, uh, the setup, the pieces, the things like that, and it will take your jumbled mess of potential rules and at least give you a starting point. I'm not going to say it's perfect, I'm not going to say that uh, it captured every uh, like insight that you have or every rule that you'd need or every revision you'd want, um, but it will give you that. And again, I show on the left here a little bit, I did that once, and then the second time it's like, okay, fine, I don't want it numbered the way you did it. Will you write it like a human being might re read it and with paragraphs instead of bullet points? Um, and in this particular game, the, it's a holiday office party theme, and I told it to add some corporate lingo into the rules just because I wanted to see what that looked like. And I think it used the words like, uh, I don't know, there's, there's definitely uh, corporate rules in there. Uh, I would not have written otherwise. <clears throat> and just, <laughs> I think this is the last one on this. The other thing it's really good at is interrogating your own game about your own rules. So you feed it the rule sets you've, you've given it, you can ask it if there's a shorter way to write a sentence, you could ask it if it has any questions about the rules that you've written. Um, that's what I did here. After reading the rules, what questions do you have? And it gave me five or six questions that it had about the rules I'd written, including for those that played, whether there was a tiebreaker scenario and how uh, it might, you 
might want to add a tiebreaker rule, which was a pretty insightful little comment on its behalf. Um, the other thing it'll do is at least identify maybe holes in your own writing. Um, it might not be perfect again, but it's probably better than you're doing on your own, even if it's just a gut check. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. The other thing is just writing assistance, um, organizing. Um, changing the stone, tone and style is a fun one. So if you give it the whole rules and you say, all right, now write it like a, a Gen Xer would say it or add emojis, like it'll do those things for you. Um, it probably, from my perspective, the best thing about it is it's an intelligent um, find and replace. So if you know, for example, you just changed all the resources from wood to trees or trees to wood, say, all right, the resource is no longer called wood. Will you replace all the references to that resource as trees? It'll re rewrite your rules and do the replacement for you, um, which is about as good as find replace, but without the thinking, really. Frankly, nobody should have grammar proofreading mistakes anymore or voice consistency because you can just ask it to do that proofreading for you. Um, you can even tell it to mark any changes with asterisks or bolds or whatever. Um, but if you feed it in there, like more or less, it returns properly written words. You should still read through it, but uh, there won't be typos, fewer grammar mistakes. Um, you can, oh, by the way, you can tell it not to, I think I did that in this one. Um, I know I actually didn't do it, but you can tell it not to make changes that it does that you don't have to. Um, so it'll only fix the things that are actually broken. All right. I don't know where I am on time, but I figured about a half an hour of that and a couple uh, 20 minutes of the law, and you guys should all be asleep by that point, and then, <laughs> then I don't have to answer the tough questions. Um, all right, so let's talk about this first. Uh, there are a ton of ethical and moral issues surrounding uh, the use of AI, uh, in particular to generative AI and uh, uh, the images. Uh, I really am not gonna pass any sort of judgment on any of those. I absolutely believe we should be paying artists that, that those things are all true. Um, I think at this point, you'll, you'll hear me say, I don't believe that the law has caught up with this and that there will probably be some elements and aspects that are gonna just have to change under intellectual property law in order to get better protections for, uh, for the original creators. Um, I don't wanna wade into this because it is just a thicket. Um, and it's definitely not without its controversy and real world controversy. <laughs> So I don't know how many of you saw this, but Wizards of the Coast put out a new book, um, uh, Big V Presents Glory to the Giants. Controversy was, it was pretty obvious, one of the artists that had done some of the illustrations had started with an AI-generated image, this one over here, and then used that image, and at least what he said he did was paint over the AI-generated image because he wanted to get rid of some of the artifacts at the time that he was using it, the tools weren't as good, um, that caused Wizards of the Coast and D&D uh, &D Beyond and others to change their art rules for what their expectation was for artists who were doing work for them. I think the really sad thing about this, from my perspective, by the way, is in some ways the way the artist actually used AI in the first place, then made it his own by you know, painting over it, um, is kind of exactly what people should be thinking about these tools as guides, aids, um, things like that. So in some ways, this was like the worst example of the outcome, which was not that the person took the original image without any work, without any editorial human intervention, and put it in the book. He, in fact, did that. Uh, but nevertheless, the artifacts still remained. People could tell. Um, on a moral side, it's weird because on the one hand, a human did intervene. It still looked bad. And then uh, all you're asking for is AI systems and platforms to get better to the point where they don't have the artifacts and so that it becomes less useful for an artist. I don't know. It's, it's very confusing for me from that perspective. But that's where we are. It's controversial. Um, it had the communities up in arms. The folks on Reddit and Twitter, uh, Twitter were, or X, I guess. Um, 
All of this is strange under copyright law, and this is probably where I'm gonna focus the next 10, 15 minutes because almost all of this is copyright. Uh, if you really are interested in copyright law and copyright issues, you should go back and listen to the last couple years of CrafterCon presentations where I cover this in more in depth. Um, but I'm gonna crash course through a couple major topics in copyright law and where the AI, art, AI generated, uh, content, uh, images, videos, and other things sort of run headlong into the copyright laws. So let's start with the first thing, which is in the, oh, and by the way, for anybody that's in an international audience, this is US based. There's mostly the same, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm sticking with US law because I know that one. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to ask me about Lithuania, you can, I won't have an answer. Um, <laughs> But in the United States, copyright law is actually written directly into the Constitution. It's one of the very few areas of intellectual property law, uh, well, really uh, anything having to do creatively, uh, that's written into the Constitution itself. It says, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors the exclusive rights uh, to their respective writings and discoveries in the Constitution. Congress then took that and they wrote the copyright laws. The thing to understand is what a copyright is actually protecting. So what a copyright actually protects are the colored words here. Original works of authorship fixed in a tangible, media, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That's what it is, that's what it covers, that's what gives you your rights um, under the copyright laws. What it doesn't cover are things like ideas, procedures. I highlight idea, and I'll come back to that in a second because it does become important under uh, some of this generative AI. So let's break this down and where this quickly runs into issues for lots of people. And the first sets of, um, oh, I should cover this. So what does a copyright get you? It gets you the exclusive right to reproduce your work, to create derivative works, which is gonna be important for the generative AI to distribute copies of your work, to perform and display it. And the big, gigantic, glaring exception is this thing known as fair use, which is also gonna play a huge component in the next section. So anybody who took, I'll just say, a Mickey Mouse image from Disney and tried to sell it on a T-shirt is likely going to have violated a copyright. It's called an infringement because Disney has the exclusive right to reproduce that work, create derivative works, namely a T-shirt with Mickey Mouse on it. Uh, if you did that, you would get a nasty gram from a lawyer like me at some company like Disney uh, saying stop. <clears throat> they have that right because they're the owner. So now one of the very first questions that happens is, all right, if an AI generates the work, the content you use, you copy and paste from chat GPT into your D&D uh, your adventure or you use a mid-journey journey image. The very first question is, who actually owns that? Like, what, what is the ownership? If you remember, if we go back to what it, what it gives, it gives the authors these rights. The owners of those copyrights have the exclusive rights to this. So what happens if a machine generates it? Well, there's actually a ton of case law, and it probably sounds crazy, for people trying to copyright things that weren't created by humans. Uh, the picture on the left is a very recent and famous case in which that monkey took a selfie with the camera provided by a nature photographer, took the selfie. Who owns the copyright on that? Nobody. The monkey took the picture. The monkey was the photographer. They were the author. There is plenty of case law that says if it's not a human, you don't get a copyright. Yeah, okay. so there's, there's actually two cases that were related, but yes, PETA sued trying to claim that the monkey should actually own the copyright, which is totally wrong. How does a monkey sue anybody for copyright infringement anyway? Um, PETA didn't have standing in that case. Um, we don't wanna get into it. Needless to say, the monkey can't own copyrights. It was, the, it was the photographer, it pushed the button, it didn't matter that the camera was owned by the photographer, um, it's, it just doesn't work that way. And the funny thing is, there's a whole litany of things that the Copyright Office has had to deal with, including <laughs> taken by a monkey, painted by an elephant, you know, 
animal skin that's, you know, basically it was tanned leather that was just happened to look a particularly nice way. They, they did that. My favorite is an application for a song naming the Holy Spirit as the author of the work. Uh, if the Holy Spirit made it, a human didn't do it, so no copyright. Well, you can imagine where this quickly devolves for uh, those folks who are doing the, using AI in the beginning here, which is that um, <laughs> the Copyright Office to date has refused to grant a copyright registration to someone who registers the copyright, in essence, on behalf of the machine itself. So in this particular case, the, the, actually it's the image in the background was created, the original uh, person who filed for copyright protection explained that it was his creativity machine, it was just the AI that solely did it, there was no human intervention, it did it all on its own. This is about the most extreme example, which is I don't think most people would try to file a copyright application that way. Um, the copyright office is like, okay, the machine did it, that's not a human, no copyright registration. Uh, the image here, which um, the office noted had at least some human intervention, um, they were willing to grant the copyright on this, it was actually an award-winning image, um, to the extent that the human had contributed to the editing and manipulation of the image, but that wasn't good enough for the original um, human generator, he wanted the whole image, including the stuff that was generated by the AI, to be his own copyright. Uh, I believe this case is still going on, although maybe it was just recently settled uh, or ended or concluded. Um, but needless to say, um, the, cor the courts, the copyright board, um, have looked at this, and there was a couple things to consider here that weren't well addressed in any of these early cases or early situations. Um, for example, the fact that in some of these image generation, the, the hilarious thing is, you know what? Well, the images themselves might not be subject matter of copyright. You can't own those because the machine generated it. Maybe the prompts themselves were creative enough to get copyright protection. That seems a little bit of a stretch, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. And they acknowledge that some amount of human manipulation was enough to get it too. So if you, uh, I'll just use the example of the Wizards of the Coast Giant, if the artist actually painted over it and did some manipulation, arguably his contributions to that would be eligible for copyright protection under these rules that they've sort of written. I'm gonna do one last comment here, which is one thing that's floating in the background of a lot of these conversations and a lot of these discussions, at least in uh, sort of academic circles is, okay, so if copyright doesn't protect an idea, that's expressly said you can't copyright an idea, is the output of your prompt just the expression of an idea? All you have contributed as a human was the idea of uh, Kanye holding a pink stuffy um, rabbit, in which case the only thing that might be sort of arguably protectable is actually an idea, and an idea is not copyrightable. <laughs> that will be an interesting to see if that ever plays out that way. Um, but let me point out one other really big issue here, and the one that I think us lawyers struggle with a lot. Is AI really just a digital camera? So there's a long history of not granting copyright protection to photographs, and a lot of artists outrage at the time the original photograph uh, cameras were put out because that's not real art. All they're doing is taking a picture. There, there's, no, there's no artistry there. Um, the same sorts of reactions you see to a lot of people using uh, generative art, uh, AI today is very similar. That, that's just a machine, there's no human involvement there, they're not doing anything, all you're doing is pushing a button. Um, for cameras, for photography, for digital photography, um, cases have already laid out that the amount of human intervention, even just pushing a button, is sufficient. Uh, that, they, that there is some amount of posing the subject in front of the camera, selecting and arranging costumes, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> That's all great, but how many people when they take a selfie think that? And I'm pretty sure most people would argue you have copyright in the picture that you took even if you didn't take a lot of that and all you did was push a button. Um, so is it sufficient to hit return 
on a computer and say that I set this up, I asked for what I wanted. Is it about how predictable it is or how coherent the outcome is? I, I think these are really hard questions actually to answer. I tend to think that there's not a lot of difference between somebody taking a picture on a digital camera today and somebody asking for a, uh, an image prompt. And then the next question is, okay, what about other, are there analogies to other things like com completely computer generated scenes in video games that maybe weren't exactly programmed the way they were? Who owns those copyrights? Are they copyrightable? they are tough questions. <clears throat> and I'll point this out too, that this is not limited to just AI art. Like, you see all the time artists who just basically set paint to go on a pendulum. They're not controlling it. They might have set it up and said, I want white paint on a black background on a pendulum. Would the artist who did these images or the artist who did the um, sort of spilling paint, did they control that output? Did they control it? Are they ineligible for copyright protection? Are they any less or more artistic than somebody who basically set up a prompt that got an image that, they, that ended up winning an award? I don't know. Those haven't come up yet. <clears throat> so this starts to, so that's the ownership issue. I mean, a lot of the question about whether you could sue for infringement, if you create art, create content using generative AI uh, is first and foremost, do you actually own it? Um, the next question is, when those systems were created, what about all that stuff that was necessary to create those AI systems? So um, the Copyright Office has this like, really great quote that it's almost by definition involved the reproduction of entire works or substantial portions of works. So in order for mid-journey to work, they had to take millions and millions and millions of other people's copyrighted work to build their training set. When ChatGPT um, built its training set, it had to read, read, I guess, uh, input millions and millions and millions of human written documents which were all subject to copyright. So the question is, was that an infringement? Was creating all of those um, data sets, that training data set, was that stealing? Was that uncompensated for copyright infringement? Was that copyright infringement on a grand mass scale? I will tell you it's probably not. Uh, and there is, a, again, a long history of this idea that copyright does have its limits and it's to promote the progress. Um, the most recent and probably the most obvious case is when Google went through its digitalization project of taking millions and millions of books for Google Books. Um, all of those books were copyrighted. They did not have the permission of the authors or the publishers. In fact, the publishers sued Google uh, for exactly what we're talking about, having created a massive library of copied books that it stored, that it made available to the world as part of Google Book Search, that it actually excerpted out entire sentences and chapters and table of contents and um, at least at the beginning, it even included images and other things like that that were clearly copyrighted and still well within copyright. Uh, this went up to the, uh, one of the appeals courts, federal appeals court, and basically Google won. Uh, that the course looked at this and said, yeah, you might have a copyright on those books and those materials, but what Google is doing is clearly fair use. It is clearly within the scope of what we permit the public to do with copyrighted information in the name of promoting the progress, in the name of advancing technology. The whole reason for granting people copyright under the Constitution is met by what Google is doing. They're providing a service, they're doing something that doesn't displace you in the marketplace, they're doing something more with your creative work that you weren't doing or couldn't do on your own, um, even though they literally copied the books verbatim in their entirety and made them available online. Um, so the most probably on point case about all this generative AI is one that Google bought, um, won less than a decade ago. There are some distinctions about what Google did and what generative AI is doing, um, and I'm gonna point those out. First of all, one question is, is how Google ended up actually using the Google Book Search and the service that it was providing sufficiently different that you might look at the 
outcome of training all of this data differently. The other, um, I think that one's a little bit harder to answer, uh, especially when we talk about what is actually part of the outcome is not the actual inputs, which is the second part. <laughs> is it okay to use it where you're using it as an index to be able to make available content and searchable? Or is, it, is there a distinction to be made that you're, what you're really doing is using that content to create something wholly different and new based on what you learned? <laughs> I actually think the generative AI side of this is actually an easier one to make that argument for than the search one, but it's a question that was not addressed in the Authors Guild case. Um, the other question a courts might ask is, is, it enough, is, is what OpenAI has done and MidJourney has done, is it appropriate? Was the whole copying of all these massive, massive image libraries or uh, all of the content on the internet necessary for them to have actually done what they did or was it enough to, they should have done something less than everything? Um, and then we got other questions like, okay, that was books. Is the books different than art, uh, images and paintings and art? Um, and you can ask the same question about videos and music and uh, we'll talk about personalities in a second. Um, one of the questions is, is there a difference on that front too? And finally, I'll just point this out. Just the fact that Google kept the data and MidJourney and uh, Open Data, uh, open, uh, ChatGPT, they don't necessarily need to keep the data in order for their trained models to work. Does that matter at the end of the day? Um, those are the questions courts are gonna have to address. Part of the reason why I think at the end of the day, Congress or some other legal change is gonna have to happen to help better address them. There are, yeah, Chris. So yes, so this is the, so at the end of the day, one of the questions that folks have about what AI is doing is, is it really any different than what humans do when they learn themselves? That they look at or they, even if they're, even professional artists who are trying to make something of a known object will use representative images to start with both poses and, you know, uh, the features. I, I mean, yes, uh, I think one of the problems here is A, the scale, B, the access. Um, and C, it's not a personal use. They're commercially making this available for others to do. I actually don't think that's a particularly, I think, I think there is a good analogy to what artists have done and art schools have done for years or people who go to museums and try to you know, copy the masters and others. Like, yeah, that's, that's how everybody learns. It's a, it, is it different that we did, a, did it with a computer? I don't know. But let's talk about the easier things, because <laughs> those questions are hard and they're, they're fraught and they have lots of, but what about these situations? Let me, let's talk about some of the most obvious things and harmful things you could do as a designer uh, if you're gonna use one of these. So if you go to MidJourney, and MidJourney will let you do this, and you say, I'd like a photograph of Mickey Mouse wearing a Starfleet captain's uniform standing on the bridge of a starship, realistic, futuristic. That is a darn good outcome for that request. I basically got it. Question is, I made this with Majority. Can I use this image? Anybody? No. no. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Can you survive uh, <laughs> Disney's voice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not so tough. It confuses against the original. That's a different one. So let me start here. Uh, your choice of tool, uh, your, your thinking trademark, which is close, it's got other issues. Um, but your choice of tool is irrelevant, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you asked uh, somebody on Fiverr to create the same image. It doesn't matter if you did this yourself and put it in your game. It doesn't matter if you use an AI system to generate it. Uh, you, are, you are infringing one or more different <laughs> copyright owners intellectual property um, by doing this. And really, the analysis is gonna end up the same for any image generated out of any system using any tool, forget the fact that it's AI. The question is, did an accused infringer have access to the infringing work of Mickey Mouse? Probably yes. Is there substantial similarity? Yes, and yes. Um, Would it not qualify as parody or satire? Well, it, you might have fair use rights. I'm not gonna go into fair use on this topic. I'm gonna get to fair use in a second on a different one. Um, 
This is why I said there's fair use discussed in two ago all crafter all cast. Those videos are on, on YouTube. And they're all on YouTube. So Eric, if you want to if you want to watch the one about fair use, it's it's out there. Um, but the reality is, absent a defense like fair use or something else, using a Mickey Mouse and a Starfleet captain's uniform more than likely infringes both Disney's and Paramount's. I think it's Paramount's. Um, uh, copyrights uh, in more than one way because you likely knew about it, <laughs> you helpfully typed it into the uh, AI prompt asking for exactly those things, so there's going to be a very little question that you had access. What if the Holy Spirit inspired you to type <laughs> it into <laughs> And that's it for tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you were inspired by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if you owned it or not, they're, you're gonna be the liable infringer for the same reason that I think the next question that immediately comes to mind in these situations is, who would ultimately be the infringer? Is the, it, are you alone the infringer? Are you and Midjourney or OpenAI the infringer for providing you access? Are they liable under a different theory that they enabled this, that they should have known? Uh, is it perhaps not you and just the company? I think all of those questions about who is the ultimate infringer are likely um, going to come up. If you tried to print that same, I'll get to you in a second, Winter, at the, the same image at the Game Crafter, you will be immediately denied uh, and uh, slap on the wrist and Heather will come after you uh, because in theory, the Game Crafter could also be an infringer in that scenario where they were printing it. Um, there is definitely substantial risk for those uh, generative companies where they enable and allow that kind of output. Um, if you look at Microsoft's generator, they don't actually let you do things like that. Um, Midjourney does for some reason. So, Winter, did you have a question? Yeah, I was gonna ask, what happens if it brings, if it gives you an image of like Mickey Mouse or something without you having asked for it? Don't use it. <laughs> I mean, So, so then, then that actually ends up in the, the bucket of whether or not you had access, how you would have ever known. Uh, under copyright law, there is this idea that you could independently create something that you had no idea was an infringement. You can do that today, right? Like if I drew a picture that I had no idea somebody else had done 10 years ago, and I had never seen, I didn't have access to it, didn't know about it, there was no evidence to point that I knew about it, I just independently created it, Interestingly, under the copyright laws, both of us would own it. Neither one of us would be an infringer. We could both sell it. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you probably don't want to do that, why it's incredibly unlikely nowadays. But yeah, then the, the point would be access. So most of the images that you see in the background that I generated uh, using Midjourney and Microsoft's, those, like, I have no idea if they would, were a direct copy of something else. I didn't have access to it. I wasn't asking for anything quite so specific as, Mickey Mouse in a Starfleet uniform on the bridge of a starship. Um, I was asking for things much more generic, uh, and it would be really hard to tie that access component back to me. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, Midjourney and its company wasn't uh, a potential infringer. So let's quickly talk about fair use, and in particular, how fair use quickly, um, I think, unravels a lot of the copyright issues for some of these companies. So, in the copyright law is written a fair use right. It is directly in there. This is probably the most litigated area of copyright law. Um, it's probably the most interesting from a game designer's perspective because very often when we're talking about copyrights and trying to use other people's uh, intellectual property, what we're really hanging our hat on um, is the fair use doctrine. Um, this is a nice court case that explained, you know, really what fair use is. If, I, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, it's basically a get out of jail free card for courts to look at something and say, you know what, yeah, this is probably an infringement, but because it does something more, and because the whole point of the copyright system under our constitution is to promote the progress of the useful sciences, when that's also interesting, uh, they will give people get out of jail free cards, avoid infringement altogether, and give society the benefit of what would have otherwise been under the exclusive control of the copyright holder. 
One of the interesting things that's happened around a lot of these AI uh, debates, and in particular about this idea that it was theft on a grand scale or copyright infringement on a grand scale by taking all these images off the internet and putting them in a database and learning from it, is what you are basically telling the world, if you, you think that was a copyright infringement, is an individual author can stop innovation at the societal level, at a macro level, just because we've given them a lever under a statute. And what our founders kind of saw is, you know what, that's probably not the case, that we shouldn't let that happen. Now, back in the day, copyright only applied to things like maps <laughs> and useful arts. It didn't cover things like photographs and images and paintings. Uh, it didn't extend that far, uh, not, uh, not at the beginning. So let's talk about why fair use applies more generally to the generative AI. And it's because of something known as transformative fair use. When you look at fair use and when you try to do this analysis about you know, whether my Mickey Mouse on a Starship bridge is a parody or uh, some other um, fair use argument, what you're really trying to do is take what the uh, what the law lays out and what the courts have done is create a four-step test and say, they, they look at the infringement, they look at the copy and say, okay, what is the purpose and character of the infringing use? What's the nature of the underlying copyright? How much of the underlying copyrighted work was used? And what effect does the second comer, the infringer, what effect does it have on the potential marketplace for the original work? And what transformative use and fair use looks at is, in particular, the purpose and character of the use. Uh, this has been a very big area of law in the last, well, basically, three years at the Supreme Court. Um, and I'll show the cases in a second for those that are interested. But the real question is, was the second use of that copyright something that was more than that copyright had ever imagined it was going to be used for? So my painting of a sunset that got swept up into one of these generative AI systems and used to train their system to paint sunsets was not a thing that my painting of a sunset had ever had in mind. And is it something that a court would look at and say, you know what, that use to enable other people to create sunsets really quickly that don't look exactly like the original one but resemble sunsets, is that use transformative enough that we're going to just ignore the fact that they took that underlying data and did something with it? Um, and the other big point is, for transformative use and for fair use, it doesn't matter if there was a commercial purpose. They could sell it, they could use it, they could do whatever they want with it. That does not really change the factors. And the reason why I say it's been a big case, uh, a big topic in front of the Supreme Court were two very big cases. One which was Google copying Oracle's Java code. That was a couple years back, where Google basically took thousands and thousands of lines of declarative code out of Java to create the Android operating system. And in that case, two giant corporations went head to head all the way to the Supreme Court. So if you don't think that millions and millions and millions of dollars were fought over transformative use and whether this is truly fair use, that, that case basically proved that wrong. Um, Google and Oracle went head to head. Google came out on top with the Supreme Court basically saying, yeah, you know what? We don't care that they copied all those thousands of lines of code because what they did with the Java declarative code created something else. It created an entire operating system and environment that Java wasn't able to do. Now, you can debate whether that's true or not, but that's the way the court came out. The other case kind of went the other direction, which is, um, and I we can bring up the image later, but there was a photographer, took a picture, Andy Warhol used that picture as essentially a reference image, created his own thing, uh, did a whole bunch of things, sold it to a magazine cover, uh, unlicensed, didn't pay the photographer a cent, the two of them went head to head. Uh, interestingly, the copy of the image, um, they're, they're exactly, you can look at it. You knew he had access, he, they looked very similar. All he did was the Andy Warhol thing uh, against the image. And lower courts were split. They went both directions. It was transformative. Andy Warhol brought some artistic creation to it. It expressed in a different emotion, a whole bunch of like 
artsy things. And then the Supreme Court's like, well, yeah, kind of, but we're not going to get into that business. You can't, that's still a derivative work. That was still the, uh, the underlying photographers. It wasn't transformative enough. It was in the same marketplace. It, it was a perfect substitute for the photographer's work. Um, yeah, Andy Warhol, you're a copyright infringer. Um, your estate now owes money to the photographer. Those are the big copyright issues. I will tell you, there are a ton of other ones that are out there if you were looking for them. Um, my Kanye West with the pink teddy bear runs straight into the rights of publicity. I'm sure Donald Trump is gonna find something to argue about too because there's plenty of those pictures that are out there. Uh, we've got trademark law potential issues for things that if you try to generate a logo or a name or something creative and don't realize that uh, what got created was somebody else's trademark. Uh, if you're using generative AI tools, I mean, you've got the first question of, would you actually own the content that you created and could you ever enforce it and stop? And maybe ironically, could you stop a second comer from creating an almost exact lookalike of your game based on uh, generative AI art? Um, and then who knows what the terms of the, some of those websites uh, content creation, you might not actually have the ability to use it commercially. Then you run into questions of copyright law. Could they actually stop you? What are they enforcing? Is there anything lost? Do you have to pay? What do you have to pay? Um, so I'll end on this one. Uh, for anybody who's tried to generate a hand, um, you might recognize the issue that most of these generative systems have, but I'll take questions for however long Davis will let me, otherwise I would think I'm actually over. Yeah, you made me start five minutes late, so we can take yeah, minutes. Okay. okay, I'll ignore you. I have a, maybe a question slash comment that you can elaborate on. Sure. And that's um, one, I work in tech, and one problem I have with the government is that they're not, a lot of the people in power aren't like technically savvy. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. Nor are the judges, by the yeah, way. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna start this by saying, any judge that my company is ever in front of, you are the smartest and wisest <laughs> judge of all time. Um, no, it's hard. I, I mean, I'm a, so my background is a computer scientist. I, you know, I was a programmer for years. I work at a software company. These are really hard topics and they're not easy. And uh, you're really relying on good lawyers to explain the facts well and the analogies well. And I'm not sure that that is always coming across that way in some of these cases. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard. So, yeah, Eric. Why would I care about a copy of anything I make? It's going to sell 500 units ever. Um, if you told me I had to pull it out of bullet, replace it with something else, I'm not operating at a scale where is somebody going to take my cover art and do something with it? It's going to matter. Yeah, so what I will say is, I mean, one, and that's very possible. I mean, I will tell you, it probably hurts the normal person who went out and printed a thousand copies who got a cease and desist letter. And, you know, as it's coming from China, it's, in, you know, impounded and then burned at the docks for copyright or trademark infringement. That's probably not a great outcome. That's me infringing somebody else. Yeah. I'm referring more to other people. Oh, other people infringing yours? Yeah, yeah like sure. Yeah. That's your prerogative. I mean, like, I, I don't know how to answer that. Yes, you could just not care about the ownership issue. Um, in fact, I would say most of the time for designers who are doing prototypes and who are doing, you know, like the game that I made, like, yeah, to show up to a proto spiel and play, like, I don't freaking care. You could show, you could take my art. I don't care. I put it online. I make it available relatively free. Most of these services themselves publish the generated art on their websites and to make it available to everybody to use. I don't care about that. I would say it's a little bit different if you're looking at going to a published product and you're trying to prevent Chinese knockoffs or you know poor quality versions of the games that you create and put your heart and soul into. But other than that, yeah, like if you don't care, you don't care. That ownership issue is not an issue then. The IP lawyer in me died a little, but that's fine. I was gonna say ownership is not an issue, so 
it's and his knockoff is making like a billion dollars and that's what he doesn't want. Yeah. Yeah. Something about imitation, right. something, yeah. yeah, yeah All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, I feel like I got through this unscathed. And I, nice, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this runs headlong into the, okay, then the, the questions start to become about copyright. Instead of copyright contract law, yeah, you, you, you have a really interesting outcome of a person downstream having more rights than the person who originally created the art and put it on their website. Um, I would say the likelihood is somebody owns some amount of copyright in that underlying image that got generated. Just, just that's my belief. I don't think that the rationale that these tools don't have any human intervention and aren't subject to copyright, I think that's, that's, I think that's wrong, like on both policy grounds and on the law. And I think it's really hard to distinguish that from a picture taken with a digital camera that's a selfie that's not staged, that doesn't have anything else, or some of these pieces of art that really don't have a lot more human intervention than letting go of a pendulum. So. Uh, yeah, but the, right, but then, but the, the question there is with respect to an individual piece of art. So the thing that got infringed has to have been displaced by this. And I. So that'll, that operates only on a piece by piece, individual by individual, not. not so. AI can generate sunsets, so everyone who's ever painted a sunset is kind of screwed. Right. I mean, uh, that otherwise, that principle doesn't work super well. Nobody would ever be able to do a, a use a reference of somebody else's sunset. You could never, it would never function that way. Um, this is really, if you think about the Andy Warhol where he did a painting from the illustration and then sold it as a magazine cover, like that was a, that was a one to one replacement of value there. Uh, the, the scenario where you take thousands of sunsets and you're able to create different sunsets out of it doesn't displace the marketplace for an infringed copy. Because A, arguably there was no access, and B, the, there's, the substantial similarity is going to look like the trained set, not the individual piece. So I think the, the, real, the real question for the AI companies is going to be the purpose and nature of how they use the underlying data. Um, potentially the generated output, you're gonna have to deal more with the four factors in their entirety. So, the Mickey Mouse example is a good one. I generated another Mickey Mouse. I knew about Mickey Mouse. Uh, yeah, Mickey Mouse in space isn't a thing that Disney did yet, but I am supplanting the Mickey Mouse ability to exercise this marketplace. It's probably not a fair use, if that makes sense. I mean, doesn't the tool itself kind of present the hazard of that? It's oh, a hundred percent. That and that goes back to the this question of who ultimately is the infringer um, okay. here, which is. Did this, is this tool also potentially liable for that copyright infringement? And I think the answer is probably yes for the same reason that TGC might be on the hook for printing a Mickey Mouse Starship Captain. Not that you guys would ever do that. You are upstanding and you know, very protective of rights holders. We had to cancel a Taylor Swift tarot deck yesterday. No. Huh. Oh, sorry I sent that through. <laughs> Good test though. Good try. <laughs> Tried. Uh -huh. So, well, thank you. You guys have been great, and uh, there's no pitchfork, so that's good. Woo,